Today, I'm a professor of energy and climate change at the University of Manchester, and I also work for the Tyndall Centre for Climate Change Research. But that just tells you what I do today. I'm 52 years old. Um, I'm a keen rock climber, um, cyclist and runner. Um, I have no children. Um, I live in, in the Peak District, a nice part of the hilly countryside in the UK. My background is unusual, I think, for an academic. You know, I left school at 16. I worked um, as a I trained as a marine engineer working on ships, on container ships, on oil tankers. Uh, I have an engineering background from my dad, who was a, worked in the nuclear power station as a, as a fitter, um, doing the maintenance work, um, mostly on the reactor, um, and a mom who was a teacher. So I come from a, from a sort of engineering type of background, I suppose. My interests were engineering. I liked. I lived by the sea, so I was interested in the sea. So I went to the sea, worked on ships. I then later on um, went to university, did a degree in engineering, and then um, went on to work on the oil rigs. So for a long time, I worked I designing and then working actually on the oil platforms in the North Sea, producing the black oil that is causing the many problems that we see today. Um, and I, I had always an interest in energy and environmental issues. I got more interested when I was working offshore, and I made the transition from being an engineer working in the oil industry to, to thinking that I need to go to university to understand more about the areas I, I was not familiar with, biology, law, economics. So I went and did a, did a master's course in that and then stayed on to do a PhD um, in uh, sustainable development, but primarily looking at climate change and the energy system. So that's a potted account of, of, uh, of who Kevin Anderson is. My field of interest now principally is on um, energy and climate change. So it's, it's, it's not just on energy supply, which most people think of. They think of just power stations, but it actually it's about the power stations, the cars, the planes, the ships, but then also about how we use energy ourselves. So it could be um, the cars that we use, the refrigerators we use, the types of lights we use. But beyond that is then, well, what do those things deliver us? They provide us with transport, the ability to spend time with our family, or to be able to read at night because the lights are on, so you understand it from a social and a cultural perspective. I have been deliberately working in, a, in a, um, an interdisciplinary environment now for 15 years. So I work alongside social scientists, economists, philosophers, as well as other engineers and physicists. And we don't, we don't just pass the information between each other. We actually try to learn each other's ways of thinking. So we've infused a different way of thinking about the problems. So I think now I'm probably no longer an engineer looking at these problems. I am. I don't think we have a word for them, really, at the moment. An interdisciplinary scientist would probably be the best way of describing it. So I try to bring those different facets, those different ways of thinking, different lenses of looking at the problem to, to address issues of energy and climate change. The premise of the papers, I think, was really to move away from an unscientific way of thinking of climate change, which was focusing on a long-term target. Very commonly, it was something like a 50, 60, or even an 80% reduction in carbon dioxide emissions by 2080. This was popular with, with policymakers, and indeed, many scientists um, unfortunately supported that approach for looking at, at climate change. But actually, what happens in 2050 has nothing to do with climate change. So, but what it does do, it allows us to carry on doing what we're doing today, and the policymakers can delay their action. They can say technology will solve it in 2030 or 2035 or 2040. But actually, we know from the science really clearly, and we've always known, that the temperature increase relates to the carbon budget, the total amount of carbon dioxide we put in the atmosphere. That has real problems when you move away from a long-term target to this idea of a carbon budget. Because a carbon budget means every year you use some of it, there's less to use the following year. So there's, there's a real problem when you, from a policymaker perspective, because that takes it from being a long-term problem to a short-term problem. We are using up our carbon budget very, very quickly. It's like having money in the bank and we are spending it far too quickly. So we have very little money left. We have very little carbon budget left going forward. So it has real major repercussions for policy. It takes us from solving it with just technology in the future to actually there are big social and political questions we, have, which we need to be asking and answering today. And that's what we did in our paper, was try to apply the maths and the emissions numbers that we have out there to this concept of a carbon budget to provide a much clearer picture to the policymakers and to civil society, to us as, as individuals, but to charities, to, uh, to businesses, about what is the scale of the challenge? How rapidly would you, do we need to reduce emissions? And it fundamentally changes the story from this long-term re um, technical response to a response that is immediate, that is about social and political um, changes, as well as technical changes. And I think that has been challenging for all of us to accept, because it has major repercussions for how all of us lead our lives today. 
um, as well as, a, as the policy makers in putting in place the appropriate policies to drive forward change. It, it depends what you aim for and that depen depends on who the we is. If I was an influential person on a small island in the South Pacific, then I would say the we in that case are people that they would be representing and they then you would say, well, we're almost too late. You need to do everything you can immediately. In the West, in the wealthy West where we are today, we should be reducing our emissions at 10, 15, 20% every single year, dramatic changes. We should be making sure there are no carbon emissions from our behavior by 2030. This is the view from, a, I would say, a poor person who's going to lose their home, their country, their whole country will be inundated, will be fundamentally changed by climate change. So for them, the this, this story is different than it might be for us. So uh, up here, we think, in the Northern Hemisphere, we often think, well, we can deal with a bit more climate change. We are resilient to, the, to climate change, both because of our geography, but also because we have a lot more money and resources to make the adjustments that are necessary. So we're fortunate on both of those cases, and therefore, we are prepared to accept a higher temperature. So you know, the rate of change for us is, is quite different from if you took the view from elsewhere in the world. I think you should stand back from that and just take a position as a, as a moral human citizen on the planet. And I do not think it's about what is good for the wealthy people who have caused the problem. I think actually we should really focus on this, is what is it we need to do to protect the most vulnerable? And that it should be our guide for the changes that we, that's necessary. And then, therefore, we should be looking at the more vulnerable people in our own community here, but also the, the vulnerable people in some <coughs> of the other communities, particularly in the Southern Hemisphere and around some of the river deltas, some of the deltas and so forth, that are much more vulnerable and susceptible to climate change. And they will not simply be able to adapt their way out of it. Many of these people will die if we do not make dramatic changes to how we are emitting our carbon dioxide today. A four degree warmer world would be devastating. Uh, four degrees C sounds not too bad on a cold day, but this is a four degrees, a global average, which, and that includes, of course, the oceans as well. So the land temperature would be much higher, maybe five or six degrees C. But of course, that also will be played out geographically around the world quite differently. So some parts will be much, much warmer than the average temperature. And the average temperature during other events like heat waves, some of the science there says that you would not see a four degrees addition. You'd see maybe an eight, nine, or 10 degrees addition on top of a heat wave. So it would exacerbate already the extreme events that, are, that our global community already struggles to deal with. We are not well adapted to the extreme events that we already have. And four degrees C would be a very large um, temperature signal on top of those extreme events. So we'd start to see really you know, major devastations to our infrastructures, the way we love our lives, but also to ecosystems. And ecosystems are not things that are just separate to us. They provide us with the pollination for the plants that provide us with the food. So what you start to see is a breakdown of all of the things, whether it's the direct physical infrastructure or whether it's actually the ecosystem services, as some people call them, that provide us with things like our food. These things would start to break down at a very rapid level. My fear of that is that we would not respond appropriately then. We would probably just simply fight. And we'd probably have considerable sort of military tensions and wars that would come out of that. I've made some personal choices, but I think it's really important that in most of us in the industrialized north, particularly the wealthy ones amongst us, the changes we make are fairly small. And we should be making much, much larger changes. So for me personally, I moved house, so I live in a smaller, I moved from a house to, to a flat. It's a very nice flat, so it, you know, um, I, you know, it is much smaller than the house I had before, but it's a lovely flat no, nonetheless, so it's still you know, too big and probably too high carbon emissions. My energy bills have come down by about 70 or 80%, so that means the amount of energy I consume has come down by about 70 or 80% in, in my house. Um, I have not flown since 2004, which has been very difficult, both personally and professionally, but in the end, I found out it's not that difficult to do. I've learned how to do that now. Um, I drive much less. I try to be careful what I buy. Um, so I've tried to make reductions in my emissions. And probably if I looked over the last 10 years now, my reductions are probably, I haven't worked it out, but somewhere in the region of 70% less than they were um, 10 years ago. So, but that's not enough. So I've made a small effort in, in in broadly the right direction, but I would need to do a lot more. But it, it is challenging in our world to do more. And I think it is e probably easier, the more people that make an effort, the easier it becomes. But I think if you, you sometimes feel a bit isolated and people ridicule you for the changes you're trying to make as well. So it's a, it's a difficult social and cultural set of changes to make. 